right. Good evening. Good evening. We are going to jump back into our question and answer summer series, and this uh, question uh, was one that was rather fun to investigate because it is a very challenging uh, question when you're taking into consideration some of the things that are specified in the verse that was actually questioned. And it's good for us to have a mindset that we want to ask questions of the Scripture, not in the sense that we are questioning the Scripture, but rather we want to know what the Scripture actually has to say, that we want to be able to understand God's Word. And this particular question is one that I thought myself was rather fascinating and fun to study because it was very challenging. We will go ahead and look at the question, and then we'll look at the verse, and then we're pretty well... Uh, the same process that I went through as I studied this out for myself, I've laid out, and we're going to run through that same process. I think that's the best way for us to learn together on this particular topic. But here is the question. In Ephesians 6 and verse 12, what does the scripture mean where it says against spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places? Pretty challenging, right? Let's go ahead and read the verse, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, to get the full of this verse, and then we'll go from there. The verse reads, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Anybody have any ideas that all these powers and authorities and principalities and wickedness in the heavenly places? Well, let's go ahead and start discussing. The first thing we need to take into mind when we consider this in this particular verse, recognize the words that are in italics. It actually, at the latter part of the verse where the question stems from, really reads, against spiritual of wickedness in the heavenly. Against spiritual of wickedness in the heavenly. Now, the actual word here, heavenly, is an adjective. So it's a descriptive term is all it is. So it's given us some sort of a description of something. As we move through this text, we'll try and gain a little bit of understanding as to what exactly it means, but I want us to go ahead and consider there are some wild and imaginative interpretations that have been given to verses like this one. Uh, some people have the mindset that it's like there are these uh, angelic beings in this unseen realm battling it out against these demonic beings, and this battle has been going on uh, since the beginning of time, and it's this continual fight that's going on, and it continues day by day. But the question you have to ask is, how do we participate in that, right? Paul's instruction that he has given to the brethren in Ephesus says, look, this is something that you are participating in. This is something that you are able to put on spiritual armor, and you are able to actually battle against. So we have to be reasonable. We have to recognize what kind of spiritual warfare it is and what kind of spiritual warfare it is not. Now I'm going to share this with you just to show you how wild and imaginative it can get before we get into this lesson. I introduce you to uh, this man who is uh, claimed to be a Nigerian prophet. His claim is that he has gone into the spiritual realm he wrestled Satan himself, and he was victorious. And that belt that he holds, he claims is the International Spiritual Wrestling Championship belt. That's how wild it gets, okay? So we need to make sure, like I said, that we're considering what type of battle it is and what type of battle it is not. Because it's definitely something that we have participation in. Paul would not lead to the idea that we need to put on this spiritual armor so that we can fend against the devil, right? So it has to be something that we can actually participate in ourselves. So here's what we're going to do. We recognize that there's words in this text that are added for our understanding. So if we move those aside first, we recognize that heavenly is actually an adjective. It's not a noun. It's not pointing to a, a literal place. It's more of a descriptive term. The next thing that we need to take into consideration is that there is some unique language in this particular verse. The heavenlies, the heavenly places. You know, it's really the only place you see this particular term, the heavenly places, is in the book of Ephesians. And we're actually going to study each one of those because this is the last time that this phrase is actually used. So if we're going to understand what it means in its last use, we need to go back and look what it says in its first use its second, third, and fourth, and then 
the last one, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, and Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, and then the last one is 6 and verse 12. But there is also this powers and, or this uh, uh, principalities and powers that's mentioned in this particular verse as well. We have to reason with that to see what exactly does that mean. This is also somewhat uh, unique to Pauline writings. You'll see it in Colossians and you'll see it in Ephesians. So that's something else that we're going to kind of keep in the back of our minds as we go through these verses and begin to study this text. But let's go ahead and go back and let's start at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. And we'll start building an understanding of what exactly does it mean as far as the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, immediately we recognize a sense of a location that's found in Jesus Christ. That's where we receive these blessings. But what I did is I went through this study is I went to other cross-references that I could add to this and say, okay, here's what it actually means in this verse. So when I think about where it is that the blessings are actually coming from, well, immediately in this text, it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blessings are coming from God. The location sounds somewhat like in the heavenlies, but the true location is in Christ, in Christ Jesus. So as I consider, even as you see on the screen, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about these blessings that we receive from God, you may think of James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights. We recognize the source, right? You could also go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Remember, even when God established a covenant with Abram, where was the source of blessing said to be coming from? The blessings were coming from God. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of earth shall be blessed. We recognize the source. God is the source, right? We remember the life of Abraham and how all these promises, essentially, that got told to Abraham would not be actually fulfilled in his lifetime. But rather, we would see the nation build up as Israel itself would build up, and they would be in captivity. Uh, Moses would go, and he would help bring them out. They would go all the way across into the promised land, right? And then there's a second promise being fulfilled. You have the nation, you have the promised land, and all the way to Jesus Christ is a third promise being fulfilled. Well, there's this unique tie that goes from Abraham all the way to us in this continuation of blessings that still come from God the Father. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, we saw in Abram and then the change to Abraham in his lifetime, there was a covenant that was established between God. The blessings always came from God with his obedience unto God and his word. Now the continuation that moves into the New Testament, we find our blessings through Christ, but still receiving them from God the Father. Now I say all that to point to the location and point to the source. In our particular text back in Ephesians, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blessings coming from God, the location where we receive these blessings is in Christ Jesus. And it also throws in there in the heavenlies. So if we take into consideration just this first verse, the first usage of in the heavenlies, it seems like it's talking somewhat about maybe in the location of God. 
in the heavens, in the abode of God, possibly. Is that far-fetched? It seems possible, right? All right, well, let's go on to the next verse. And we're going to continue just to go each time this is used, and we're going to study it out and then reason at the end and see what exactly is it actually saying. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's start in verse 18. Our term is in verse 20, but we'll start in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, in this particular verse, the last one was somewhat of a focus on the blessings that are found uh, through Christ coming from God. Now, this one is showing more so the power of God. And he's saying, by the power of God, Jesus Christ has been raised up and now is seated at his right hand in the heavenly places. Again, if you take consideration, what are we talking about as far as the heavenly places? The possibility right now that probably comes to mind is we're talking about in the abode of God. Where's Jesus Christ sitting? Okay, let's look at a few verses just to make some cross-references. Consider Psalm, chapter, or Psalm 110 and verse 1. Psalm 110 and verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, jump over to Acts, Acts chapter 2. Remember the first uh, sermon that was preached by the Apostle Peter. And he used this particular verse, and he actually used it to teach in his lesson to all those that were there on the day of Pentecost. And what's unique about that particular verse when he uses it, he goes ahead and he makes recognition to exactly who it is that's under discussion in that verse. Verse 34 of Acts chapter 2, it says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Pretty cut and dry who we're talking about, right? It seems pretty cut and dry as far as where we're talking about of the location that's under consideration. You consider Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Remember his own disciples as they were still standing there, not knowing exactly 100% what all was going on. And they watched Jesus ascend to the heavens. And they're standing there, they're staring just like, now what? Right? And they have to be kind of pushed along like, hey, time to get busy, right? They were still a little bit clueless to the full plan, but they watched him ascend. We can read in the text and we understand that Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. It sure seems to be talking about this dwelling place of God, the abode of God. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, the more we go through these verses, the harder it's going to be to pinpoint it to that specific location. The more it might start to seem like it's more of just a descriptive term that is referencing the spiritual in some sense rather than a specific location. Look down at verse 21 because this is our first use because we're also looking, remember, at the powers and principalities as we go through this because that was also in chapter 6 and verse 12. Look down at verse 21. It says, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So Jesus in his resurrection, Jesus in God's power of raising him to sit at his right hand is ascended far above any power, principality, dominion. And what did it say? Of this age or of the age to come. What does that tell you? We're talking about physical powers. We're talking about earthly powers. In this context, if we're talking about powers of this age when Paul was writing this letter and the ages to come, it has to be a reference to the powers, the leading figures, the authorities that had some sort of influence over society in that time. So our first recognition of the powers and the authorities pushes leaning to the idea of we're talking about earthly powers. Rome, that's one of the biggest powers of that time, right? They would have had great pull. They would have had a great uh, uh, leverage on society. 
it's going to get a little bit more tricky as we move through this, though. So. Let's go ahead and go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. Let's start back in verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. <clears throat> but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now it's also saying that we are sitting with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. So if there's this us being sitting in the heavenly places as well, we know that we have to be talking spiritual. We pretty well had that gathered from the beginning. We're talking about a spiritual sense, not a physical sense. So if we're talking about us being sitting with Christ in this spiritual realm, we have to be talking about those who are in what? The body of Christ, right? Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. It says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we gain access. We've already recognized these blessings that we receive because we are in Christ Jesus. He talked about the hope in the end of chapter 1 that he hopes that uh, the, the brethren in Ephesus realize that their hope should be in the resurrection because God was able to raise Jesus from the dead, ascend him to heaven, that our hope should be in that just the same, that we can be raised from the dead also. And now he's even pointing to the fact, yes, we are with Christ in the heavenlies. So we have to be talking about the church. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Again, the firstborn from the dead. Remember, we talked about the power of God in the previous verse, the power of God in raising Jesus from the dead, and now he's saying he is the firstborn from the dead, saying that there will be more. And he says right now, essentially, you are seated with Christ at the right hand. How is that possible? Prophetic perfect. There are verses where prophetic perfect is used essentially because God's promises are sure. If we do our part, yes, we will be with God one day in eternity. And essentially right now, because we are the spiritual body, we are the Lord's church, we also sit in the heavenly places together in Christ Jesus. Now, so far... Everything that we've discussed as far as it relates to the heavenly places as uh, where this is that we're actually considering still seems like somewhat the abode of God, right? Seems to be what's being discussed. Uh, the heavens in the sense of where God dwells, the possibility, okay? In a spiritual sense. Get Jesus, when he returns, we know that when he returns, he will gather together his own. He will present the glorious bride, the church, to God. But in a spiritual sense, it's saying because we are in Christ, we are already sitting in the heavenly places with God, spiritually speaking, prophetic perfect. Now, let's go ahead and move to chapter 3 in verse 10. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more challenging to fully wrap our minds around. Chapter 3 and verse 10. Let's go ahead and look. Uh, let's start in verse 8. It says, To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the, my uh, the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. All right, so Paul essentially, he's saying that also I, Paul, the chief of all sinners, right? Uh, the mercy of God has been extended to me to the point that uh, I am able to also preach the gospel, the good news. 
and I'm going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and they're added to the body of Christ just the same. And because of this, the manifold wisdom of God, this knowledge that God had even all the way back at the beginning of time, before the foundation of the world, jump back to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without a blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. It points back to the beginning of time, essentially even creation. You might also think of John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, or the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created through the Word, right? And then in verse 14 it says, and the Word became flesh. So all these things, everything that was in the mind of God, even at the beginning of creation, in his eternal plan that is found in Jesus Christ through his death, burial, resurrection, our entrance into his bride, the church, is now on full display for all to see. What's interesting in this text is, he says, to the powers and the principalities. So we have to wrestle with that one a little bit. You think about Romans chapter 11 in verse 33. It says, Oh, the depth and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. There are things of the mind of God that we may not ever fully grasp because he has infinite wisdom and knowledge. But these things, Paul says, things pertaining to the church, this segment of his knowledge is on full display so everyone can fully see what God's eternal plan and purpose in Jesus Christ is. To intent, verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, in our previous use, when we looked at uh, chapter 1 and verse 21, and it was talking about the powers and the principalities and the dominions, it gave the reference with this age. So it kind of gave us an understanding to what we were talking about. In this particular use, it does not give us the reference to of this age. So if it is not of this age, then what might it be? That's where it gets pretty tricky, right? You think about verses, I believe it's uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, maybe verses 10 through 12-ish where it talks about these things that even the angels sought to know. The idea behind that is that even in the times past, in the old law, where the prophets would go forth and they would proclaim the message of God, even though they didn't fully understand the message of God at that time, they understood parts of it, but they didn't fully grasp everything that they were teaching the people. You think about Isaiah, and he spoke about the one who was going to go like a lamb to the slaughter. Did he know exactly who that was? Right? It's hard to say. There are prophecies that were spoke of in the Old Testament that they didn't actually, the prophets, know exactly who it was that they were talking about or when the fulfillment would come. In that, these things being, these things being shown now, the manifold wisdom of God, the fullness of all of those prophecies, and it says in that particular text, even the angels desire to look into those things. What that would mean is that there were things as it pertains to man's salvation that even the angels of God did not know until the time of man's salvation came. Uh, plausible. It's possible, right? The only thing that you have to take into consideration when you take that line of thought, and I'm not saying it's wrong by any means because it is a good line of thought. We have supporting scripture that will support that idea. The one thing I ask is if we're talking about powers in the sense of angelic beings or something of that nature and a lot of commentators they go to the idea of angelic beings they go to the idea of demonic beings and things of that nature <clears throat> and it goes back to this battle in this unseen realm right that's taking place by somehow our lives and how we live them here in the flesh we're contributing to that warfare that's going on in the unseen realm it's a little challenging to say okay is that right or not I would ask, when we look at powers and principalities in chapter 1 and verse 21, and it gives us a reference to the powers and principalities of this age and the ages to come, and we look at chapter 6 in verse 12, it also gives a reference to 
the powers and principalities of this age, once it talks about the rulers of darkness. So in the two uses on both ends of the book, it gives reference to powers and principalities, authorities essentially is what it's talking about, that are worldly. So would it make a transition in the middle to these spiritual authorities, angelic beings possibly? Not saying it couldn't, but it seems like the same train of thought would track from one end of the book to the other end of the book, right? It seems to be the case. Let's go ahead and let's look at verse, chapter 6 and verse 12. Still trying to ask the question, are these powers and principalities angelic beings, and how are they also linked, it says, to the heavenly places? That's another thing. If we're talking about powers and principalities that are earthly, how are these earthly powers and principalities linked to the heavenly places that is mentioned in chapter 3 and verse 10? There's a lot of things we have to ask when we go through this text because it is rather challenging to come up with a dead set answer on what is being discussed in this text. But let's go ahead and go to chapter 6 and verse 12 and let's throw everything in there where it really gets a little bit more confusing and harder to dissect. Let's jump back to verse 10 and remember, the main thing that we have to keep in mind when we go through this text is that this was information that the Apostle Paul was giving to the brethren in the first century. He was saying, look, you're part of this. And by some means, you're participating in this warfare. It still means something to us today. It's still a war that's going on today in some sense that we are participating in. So it has to be able to tie back to us just the same. Chapter 6 and verse 10. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. That's the information that's given, and then the following verses goes into the description of the spiritual armor that we are to arm ourselves with to go into this battle. Turn over to Col uh, for, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 real quick. Paul adds a little bit of insight, and it sounds very similar to the beginning of verse 12 in the Corinthian letter that helps us to better understand, I think, what it is that he's talking about in this specific, specific verse as well. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verses 3 through 5. Verses 3 through 5. For we do not walk, or for we walk in flesh, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Uh, it's already sounding a lot like Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against uh, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I apologize because I did not swap that slide. I'm trying to get used to using this uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so the Apostle Paul in the Corinthian letter, he makes recognition to this battle that's going on he says, look, though we are in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. He says our weapons are not carnal. We're not picking up these actual uh, physical weapons and going into a physical battle. But he does say the weapons that we have, they are powerful in God. They're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And what does he say that we're actually doing in that? Look at verse 5 again. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What Paul is talking about is a battle of ideas, a battle of teachings, a battle of what you could call interpretations, a battle of things that people 
come up with ideas of their own mind where they begin to exalt things above God. He says, bringing every thought into captivity. This battle that he's talking about, this war that he's talking about, and the knowledge that we have through the Word of God that we are able to go to war with, and we are able to go to war against any kind of idea, any kind of teaching, anything that is presented to exalt itself above our Almighty God. He says, this is what your war is. This is what you are doing, a spiritual battle. We'll go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's continue to study out the text. Ephesians chapter 6. Recognize who it is that we're fighting against, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil, the devil is who is behind all of the schemes, the plots, the temptations. And now he's talking again about these powers, these principalities. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. Now remember in the first use when we heard about the powers and the principalities said of this age and of the ages to come. He ties this one back to the idea of this age. So what kind of powers or principalities essentially all that is is rule or authority is what's being spoken of. What kind of power or principality rule would they have been having problems with during the first century? One of the greatest influences there was Rome, right? The Romans had a major pull, a major influence. They were tugging at them in every direction, right? That's a possibility when we consider that it's something of that age. If it's of the ages to come, what powers and principalities also still have pull against Christians today? What was Chris's lesson on Sunday evening, right? What was it that our president was commending, right? Powers, authorities, I'm not trying to get political law on doings, pointing to the fact that even leading figures who have positions of authority, who present ideas, things that are against the nature of God, these are things that we have to go to battle against every single day of our lives, things that we have to stand opposed to, things that the Apostle Paul says you will battle against if you're a child of God. Notice in this text that of this age, in verse 12, it modifies the rulers of darkness. Well, the rulers of darkness is parallel to principalities and powers. Therefore, the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places is a continuation of the previous description. Again, if we're talking about what is actually said against spiritual wickedness in heavenly against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly. So in some sense, there is wickedness in spiritual matters coming from authorities, from powers, from rulers. It seems pretty logical to think we're talking about rulers even of that age who were pushing and forcing things upon them, trying to get them to conform, to go and to do the things that they do, to participate in the things that they participate in, well, you think about what would have had a major pull even outside of Rome in Ephesus. Think about the Temple of Diana. The Temple of Diana would have had a major pull. Turn back to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Remember, we're talking about in a time where they were very polytheistic, believing in all kinds of gods. And they worshiped these gods on a regular basis. And they wanted people to come and to worship these gods. Why? Because there was also profit in it. Acts chapter 19. Look at verse 21 and following. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of, those to minister, uh, two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way, talking about those who are of Christianity, those who are in Christ, the church. Verse 24, 
for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. It's recognizing the fact that this man made a healthy living off of this Diana, this temple of Diana. These men would actually make these little trinkets, these little charms, and they would sell these things, and people would come by the hordes, and they would go to this temple, and they would practice in these pagan worships and do everything that they did. And Paul is saying, look, you're going to have to go to battle against these spiritual matters, against these authorities who try and push this stuff on you. You stand true in Christ, stand for what is right, and do not give in. Look at verse 25. He called together, or he called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. A direct point to Diana as well. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised in her magnificence destroyed. And listen to this whom all Asia and the world worship. Now, when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Do you think that there was some sort of um, leverage linked to this temple? These people were ready to, and actually stirred up a riot, ready to kill the Apostle Paul because of the things that he was teaching. Because he came in saying, look, that's no God. This is man's ideas. This is man's way of thinking. This is worldly spirituality, if you can put those two things together. This is worldly mindset trying to think on spiritual matters and apply their own reasons or their own understanding to these things. And Paul says that's not right. So, listen to this quote. I found this, and this is from a very long time ago. I couldn't exactly get the date, but here's the quote. I have seen the walls of the hanging gardens in, of ancient Babylon, the statue of the Olympian Zeus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the mighty work of the high pyramid and tomb of Masalus. I suppose that's how that's read. But when I saw the temple at Ephesus rising to the clouds, all the other wonders were put in the shade. This thing held such glory in the eyes of the people of that time. He says, as I stood and I looked at this great temple of Diana, it put everything else in the shade. Do you know that this temple was one of the seven wonders of the world in the ancient world in that time frame? One of the seven wonders of the world. Do you know how much... Uh, how much people that this actually drew in to see this temple? Not only just to worship and things of that nature, but just to come see it. Even for these silversmiths to make their earning, to make this no small profit that they made. It had a major influence on society in that time. When I go back to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, and I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to fully wrap my mind around everything that is being said in that verse. But what I do think I understand is when it talks about these powers and principalities, I'm thinking that they're talking about powers of that age, just like it says. And that they had such an influence that Paul is warning against them and warning the Christians that you need to arm yourselves and you need to be ready because they are presenting these spiritual things that are not spiritual at all. They're not godly at all. If I'm thinking of the heavenly places correct, I'm thinking of a descriptive term that is alluding to a spiritual realm, a general big picture type of word, or to spiritual things or thinking. The word that is used here for heavenly is actually used in the neuter case. So it's not masculine, it's not feminine, it's neuter, so it actually could be added things rather than places. So we're talking about possibility of just spiritual things being under consideration. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verses 1 through 6 again. 
And look at the connection that's made as it relates to the minds and the thinking. Ephesians chapter 2 starts and it says, And you made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. This is who we once used to be. We were children of wrath. We were following the prince of the power of the air. We were following Satan. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, it says the devil's the one we're actually battling against. That's who we used to fight. Now look at verse 4. It says, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My suggestion is that it's talking about a spiritual realm, possible, or spiritual things and spiritual thinking. It's hard to say. It seems to be the case that it might kind of change as Paul goes through the letter as far as the exact understanding. Because even in the previous verses, when we looked in the beginning, it seemed a lot like we're talking about the abode of God. But then when you start talking about these powers and principalities, how can they have any say in the spiritual when it's powers or principalities of this earth? It's by their lack of understanding of spiritual matters and their corrupt spiritual teaching and corrupt spiritual ideas that they are presenting to other men. Look at a couple more verses with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 48 through 49. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> Look at verse 48. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly, there's our word, same Greek word, as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the son or of the man of dust, we have lived this life of the flesh, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, the spiritual man. We also must live this spiritual life, heavenly life. One more verse. Go to John chapter 3 and verse 12. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus and he was questioning in him by night? And Jesus started speaking to him on heavenly matters, spiritual matters, right? And he was getting a little bit confused about what Jesus was actually talking about. So much so, if you look at chapter 3 and verse 12, Jesus says, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Same Greek word used in this text. Heavenly things. Things pertaining to spirituality. Things pertaining to spirituality that are aligned with the will of God. What seems to be the case is it is a reference to the authorities or influences who affected spiritual thinking in the first century as well as still affecting spiritual thinking today. People whom Satan engages us with temptations or negative spiritual ideas. And if you also tie back to chapter 3 and verse 10, the impact that the fulfillment of the church's mission has against the battle of ideas against worldly thinking and teaching. Essentially, a battle of anything, thought, or teaching that exalts itself above God. That's where my study led me. Again, I will tell you, it is a very difficult text. It is a very challenging question. I appreciate the question. It was a very good question. And I even know who asked it. It was a very good question. It was one that caused me to study a lot. But what we come to at the end of this, when we think about what it is that the Apostle Paul is saying, when I consider these powers, these principalities, when I consider the heavenly, whether it's these things, these spiritual things, the heavenly things, whether it's the spiritual realm itself that's being discussed, what I know from this text is the Apostle Paul is saying, look, you are engaged in warfare. 
And it's not this idea that there's these angelic beings that are way out in this off distant area. They're battling these demonic beings that I have no part in. There is warfare that's taking place in the life that I live, and yes, I am engaged in it. And the way that I can succeed, the way that I can be victorious, is that I put on the armor that is listed in the upcoming verses in chapter 6. That's how I'm going to get through. That's how I'm going to be victorious. Be ready to go to battle. And know that the authorities, the ruling powers, the leading figures of our age, just as they did in the first century, are going to present things that are exalted in their eyes higher than God, that are lies, that are not of God's will, and we must stand against it. Everything that the Bible teaches us is that there is a spiritual war going on. And here's the thing, we're in that fight daily. It's a fight that you go through on a regular basis, a fight that maybe you don't always do your best at. Some of the times we have, we know we have all the time, everything that we need that God has supplied us with to be able to fight this fight. Sometimes we leave some of our weapons, we leave some of our armor lay when we begin to blend back into the world. Just like we always do, we'll offer the invitation. Where do you stand in this battle as it relates? Half the time when you go out into the world on your regular daily basis, do you realize that, yes, you are engaged in warfare? Do you even consider it? That Satan is striving and trying every single day to pull you into temptations and to make you fall short of the glory of God so that he can claim you as one of his. If we're not aware of that, we had better be because he is. And he wants you back because right now God has you. If there's anything that we can help you with this evening, please let it be known as together we stand and as we sing.